Hello, my name is Christopher Renstrom, and this week I would like to talk to you about the Chinese Lunar New Year taking place on February 10th. I, like so many other people, are so fascinated by Chinese astrology. It's such a wonderful reminder that there are so many astrologies that are out there in the world. Of course, we're used to the Western astrology with its 12 signs of the zodiac, which are associated to 12 constellations. Those signs are Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and finally Pisces. And then it begins the circle again. So those are the characters of our Western zodiac, of our Western astrology. But there's a Chinese astrology. There's a Mesoamerican astrology. There's an Indian astrology. And these are just the astrologies we know about. Every major civilization on the planet created some sort of form of astrology, and that was in order to tell time. Astrology is the world's first calendar, but as interpreted as symbolized in all of these different cultures. But when I say something like the major civilizations created their own astrologies, what is kind of lacking from that remark is all of the astrologies that were created by other civilizations, other societies, other astrologies that didn't survive, either because they fell out of practice, there were proper records, the civilization may have been wiped out or assimilated by a larger civilization. So the astrologies that we know of, Western astrology, Indian astrology, Chinese astrology, Mesoamerican astrology, these are just the ones we know about. And it sort of staggers the imagination to think of all the ones we don't know about. But Chinese astrology goes back a very long time in the Chinese civilization, which is one of the oldest, if not perhaps the oldest, continuing civilization from the time of its inception. And what I mean by civilization is presiding civilization, that you, that you can almost see a through line that goes from ancient Chinese civilization to modern day. The memory and the history is that rich. But as I said, every civilization, every society had some form of astrology. It was in order to tell time. They would look at the rising and the setting of the sun that began the day, that began the night. There were the changing of the seasons. And so what they would do is that they would follow the star patterns in the sky, or they would follow the planets like we do in the West along the ecliptic in order to tell time. Now, in Chinese astrology, in China, Coordination of human activity with the sun, moon, and stars can be traced back to the Neolithic cultures of the 5th millennium BCE. There are artifacts of coordination of human activity with the sun, the moon, and stars that go back to the Neolithic cultures. Uh, this isn't exclusive to China itself. We've also seen this in different parts of Europe, and we've also seen it in different parts of Africa. This idea of tracing the patterns goes back to fifth millennium BCE. Then it was Sima Shang, uh, China's first great historian, who observed, quote, ever since the people have existed, when have successive rulers not systematically calendared the movements of the sun, moon, stars, and asterisms? I love that uh, Sima Shan uses calendared, uh, ca uses the word calendar as a verb. You know, since people have existed, uh, when have rulers not calendared, you know, the events of their civilization, their society, according to the sun, moon, stars, and asterisms. Uh, stars, he's probably referring to as the planets, the wandering stars, and asterisms are a collection of stars. Sometimes they're constellations, sometimes they're not. So he's basically saying this uh, 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 very early in China's history. Now, by the end of the third millennium BCE, attention in uh, Chinese civilization had already begun to focus on the circumpolar region as the abode of their sky god, Di. And from this time on, the North Celestial Pole became the locus of spiritual significance. This is taken from Astrology and Cosmology in Early China by David W. Pakhenyar. What they're saying here is that Beginning in the 3rd millennium BCE, b before the Common Era, the focus had been towards the North Pole. And what they saw as being important 
was the relationship of the stars as they revolved around the North Pole. So that's where the focus was in Chinese astrology. Just to juxtapose here, in Western astrology, we look to the ecliptic. That's the circle that goes around the middle of the world and kind of sort of around the equator and holds the world together like a belt. And actually, our zodiac comes from the idea of a circle or a belt of animals or a belt of creatures, which also refers to the ecliptic. This is the path that the sun and moon travel across the sky. But in ancient Chinese civilization, that's not where they were looking. They were looking up towards the pole star. And, and basically, where they were looking was the Big Dipper to find the pole star. Now, what's fascinating about this is that this becomes systemized in China in 3rd millennium BCE, which is around the same time that Western astrology is becoming systemized in Sumeria. Western astrology becomes systemized in Sumeria in the 3rd millennium BCE. So this is one of those synchronous events. They just happen to be happening at the same time. Now, it's not really quite a coincidence because we're talking about entire millennium here, <laughs> but, um, but, but this is when these are becoming more systemized. This is when they're becoming recorded, whether it's on tablets, scrolls, whatever have you. So in Western astrology, as I said, we track the sun, moon, and planets as they travel along the ecliptic, where the 12 signs of our zodiac are to be found, the ones that I already mentioned. But in Chinese astrology, the focus was on the handle of Ursa Major, which is what we call the Big Dipper. When you think of the symbol of the Big Dipper, what is it? It's a rudder, okay? So it's like a handle. And so it was also known as a handle in Chinese astrology or in Chinese star maps. Okay, so the North Star or Polaris is in the Ursa Major constellation. That's the Great Bear uh, constellation. And the Ursa Major could be used to locate Polaris, as Polaris is the brightest star of Ursa Major, that, that collection of stars. So from this northern point, remember, we're looking out kind of like uh, on the ecliptic. Um, in, in, in China, they're looking to the northern point. That's the pole star. From this northern point, the Chinese divided the cardinal asterisms, that's a star group, into four groups to be associated with the four seasons. So these four star groups, which revolved around the pole star, the northernmost point, these were associated, like I just said, with the four seasons. Now, one star group was called the blue-green dragon, and that was associated with the spring. Another star group, the vermilion bird, was associated with the summer. This was followed by the white tiger uh, star group, which was associated with the autumn, and finally, there was the Dark Warrior, a nefarious, mysterious figure, an encircling of turtle and snake. And this was said to be winter. So by the late Zhao Dynasty, which was 1046 to 256 BCE, Shan Wen, uh, which means sky pattern reading, had taken as its frame of reference the 28 lunar lodges into which the sky was divided from this northern point. The 28 lodges governed over the 12 provinces of the Chinese empire, and the handle of the dipper, the Big Dipper, was regarded as seconding them. So in other words, the 28 lodges, the lunar mansions in which uh, planets would pass beneath, um, these were set up in the sky, dividing up the sky as a kind of municipality, and they were associated to the 12 provinces in China proper below, and then the handle of the dipper was seen to endorse the governance of the 28 lunar mansions itself. Okay, so you have these 28 different governors, and then the handle. The Big Dipper would say, yes, I decree that. No, I don't decree that. And, you know, it had basically yes and veto power over the um, 28 mansions which lurked below. And this is what tied the sky to earth. Although in ancient China, sky and earth were seen as the same. There was no real division. It was all one idea. It was all one governing entity. Now, the Chinese zodiac, when we talk about the year of the dragon, for instance, the Chinese zodiac has 12 animals. It has 12 animal characters. This is not the same as Chinese astrology. Okay. And that's a very important distinction. 
In Western astrology, the planets are moving in front of the zodiacal symbols, okay, which are correlated to the constellations along the ecliptic. In Chinese astrology, there is this focus about the star groups around the northernmost star and their impact on the provinces of China itself below. The 12 Chinese zodiac animals had nothing to do with star groups, all right? Nothing to do with star groups whatsoever. Um, now, the Chinese uh, zodiac consists of 12 animals that first appeared in the Zangao period, which is 5th century BCE. And the Chinese zodiac right away became a popular way to determine one's birth year. So in the West, we'll talk about our birthday, our birth time, our birthplace. With the Chinese zodiac, because it wasn't really associated to the emperor, I mean, the emperor did chart the governance of his state based on the star maps that were going up around that northern star, that pole star that it was talking about. But when it came to the Chinese zodiac figures themselves, these were used to figure out what year you were born. So there was no um, birthday, there was no uh, birth, birth time, and who cared about the birthplace? So it was really the year. I was born in the year of the dragon, or I was born in the year of the snake, or I was born in the year of the ox. So when you referred to a Chinese zodiacal figure, a Chinese zodiacal animal, you were referring to your birth year. Someone could say, oh, you were born, you know, like eight years ago, or oh, you were born, let's see if I can count, 42 years ago. They would, they would, able to determine what year that you were born. And this is the first association with the uh, Chinese zodiac animals and how they came, became so popular. Now, what follows from this is a counting system. Remember that the 12 zodiac animals are not connected to constellations. They are not connected to stars at all. They are on a fixed circle. One follows the other, but this is used more to count. So each of the 12 animals in the Chinese zodiac stands for a year in a 12-year cycle. We're used to thinking of our zodiac as the 12 signs within a year cycle. In the Chinese zodiac, each of the 12 an animals stands for a year in a 12-year cycle. They will also stand for a day in a 12-day cycle. And finally, they will stand for every two hours in a 24-hour day. So you could be born in the year of the rooster, on the day of the pig, in the hour of the snake. Okay, so it's it's a counting schematic. Okay, you almost imagine like a clock, but it's a clock within a clock within a clock. One clock is cataloging the years, one clock is cataloging the day, and the other clock is cataloging what hour of the day. Okay, and these are each connected to where the animal on the circle is turning. It's very elaborate. Um, it's very simple. Um, and it's, it's analogous to our planetary hours and our planetary days, but that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> but anyway, that's just to show that we have actually an analogy of that. There, there's a correlation that exists there. Okay. So essentially the 12 zodiac signs or the 12 zodiac animals were used for counting measures of time rather than being connected to the constellations in the sky. So what are the 12 animals of the Chinese zodiac? Well, arranged in clockwise appearance, they are the rat, the ox, tiger, hare, dragon, snake, horse, ram, monkey, rooster, dog, and boar. Okay, so these are the characters of the Chinese zodiac. Each of them rules a year. And then if you break it down even further, each of them is going to rule over a day and a time of day. In Chinese cosmology, these symbols correspond to the 12 divisions of the celestial equator known as the earthly branches, DZ, each of which also corresponds to a direction. So, this is what's happening here. We talked about the North and like uh, star groups that, that, uh, that follow the, the North Star. Now, with the Chinese zodiac animals, they are being associated to the equator, okay? Uh, and, and when they're being associated to the equator, which is 
uh, think of a compass. Actually, they're being associated to a compass. That's the best way to think of it. Each of the animals corresponds to a direction on a compass. We're going to go with compass. Compass is a really, really good example, okay, or illustration. So that rat was associated to the north, ox was associated to north, northeast, tiger was east, northeast, hare or rabbit was the east, a dragon was east, southeast, snake, south, southeast, horse, the south. After the horse, which is the direction of the south, comes the ram, which is south, southwest, the monkey, which is west, southwest, rooster, which is the west. After that is the dog, which was west, northwest, and finally the boar, which was west, northwest, and then you repeat. So where we had, uh, where we have a, uh, a cycle of months, which is associated to a calendar, this is being associated to a compass, which is set up with directions, which has a str tremendous significance in ancient Chinese culture and Taoism, but we're also not going to get into that today. I'm just using that as a reference point and to really make the point that the Chinese zodiac animals, the Chinese zodiac signs are not connected to star groups. They are a means of counting and measuring time, but they are connected to directions, directions that you would find on a compass. Now, this whole thing of 12 signs, okay, that sounds familiar. We can think of our signs and Chinese, signs, Chinese zodiac signs um, and say, okay, that's, that's a, that, that makes sense. But this thing of like, of, of, of each Chinese zodiac sign ruling a year, ruling for a year, think of it as being in the ascendancy for a year. Some of you astrologers out there might be like, hmm, 12 years, what goes around in 12 years? And you're going to see where I'm going next with this. Okay. These were connected. These 12 signs of the zodiac were connected to the 12 celestial stations of the planet Jupiter, okay, rather than the sun as it traveled along the ecliptic. So here in Chinese zodiac, we are using the ecliptic they are not connected to star groups. They are connected to segments of a circle that have been divided into 12, that have been associated with an animal of the zodiac, and that the planet Jupiter is going to move it from one, from one section that's assigned to an animal of the zodiac to another section that's assigned to the animal of a zodiac. That sounds, we're used to think of that in terms of the sun going from sign to sign, going through all 12 signs in one year. But in the Chinese zodiac, it is Jupiter. So uh, where the sun takes a month to go through all 12 months to make a year, Jupiter is going to take a year. And so um, this, in Chinese, um, with, with the Chinese zodiac, uh, it's Jupiter, which is the planet of good fortune and higher purpose that moves through the 12 sections of the ecliptic that are governed by a sign of the zodiac. This is why when we say we are now in the year of the dragon, everyone gets really excited and happy because Jupiter, who we know from the West is the planet of good fortune and higher purpose, is now blessing everyone who was born in the year of the dragon. Jupiter spends one year in each sign, which is why we will say that 2024 is the year of the dragon. This is the year that the dragon is prominent. People born in the year of the dragon will be favored this year. Our version of it is, oh, Jupiter's entering my sign. Yay. <laughs> but the Chinese have set this up so that it's the beginning of every year. No, no switching signs halfway through the year or at some other point. It's not connected to the movement of the planet. It's connected to when Chinese zodiac sign, when the wheel turns in its direction. What is the dragon? It's one of the 12 zodiac animals in Chinese astrology. The dragon in Chinese zodiac is a yang symbol, meaning that it is masculine. That is the thing that we know about the dragon. It is a yang symbol. If you're familiar with yin and yang, is the masculine part and, and yin is the feminine part and they're combined together in a in sort of like two koi swimming around one another in a pond. One follows the other, follows the other, follows the other. Um, so the dragon is a yang symbol, meaning that it's masculine. 
What I found interesting in some research that I did is that the tiger and the dragon, who were the primary symbols of yin and yang, the two cosmic forces that direct the movement and transformation of chi, of chi, uh, which is the vital energy that makes up all things. The tiger was yin and the dragon was yang. And what was even more fascinating is that these symbols predate the Taiji diagram, which is the well-known diast diagram of yin yang, which portrays the light half of the circle dovetailing into the dark half of the circle. Well, that didn't appear until the beginning of the Song dynasty, which was 960 to 1279 AD. Okay, so before the common era, era um, you know, for, for millennium, it was the tiger and the dragon that symbolized yin and yang. Now, most Chinese dragons' pictures uh, in, in ancient uh, Chinese uh, culture and art have long bodies like snakes and sharp claws like hawks. They rarely have wings or breathe fire like the Western version. Chinese dragons live at the bottom of rivers, lakes, or anywhere with water. So they're, they're, they're very strongly connected to water. Dragons symbolize imperial power, good fortune, power over weather, and a pioneering spirit. What's kind of fascinating there is that you can sort of hear some of the qualities or characteristics of Jupiter coming in. Jupiter in Western astrology is the planet of emperors. And so in China, uh, dragons symbolize imperial uh, power. They symbolize the emperor. Um, now, what we have to remember is that in ancient China, people lived mainly on agriculture. The rain and wind played an important role in people's lives. They believed that there was something powerful controlling the rain and the thunder. In Chinese mythology, the dragon was such a powerful beast that, as I said, it lived in rivers, lakes, and seas. The dragon was used as a symbol of great power, a ruler even of the emperor himself. According to Chinese legend, the yellow emperor, Huang Di, who was a legendary tribal leader, launched a series of wars against nine tribes in the Yellow River Valley. When he won these wars, he incorporated the other tribes' totems into his dragon totem. This explains why the dragon has attributes belonging to nine other creatures. The dragon in China has eyes like a shrimp or carp, uh, antlers like a deer, a big mouth like a bull, a nose like a dog, whiskers like a catfish, a lion's mane, a long body like a snake, scales like a fish, and claws like a hawk. Dragons in Chinese mythology could control the weather and seasons. Although they were wingless, you know, wingless, they were without wings, they could fly, and they could change the rain patterns. In Chinese mythology, dragons often aided the human race when natural disasters struck. One such legend, the Jade Emperor and the Four Dragons, exemplifies the relationship between humans and dragons. Now, according to myth, there were four powerful dragons witnessing a devastating drought taking place on mainland China. Now, these four dragons spoke on behalf of the human race to convince the deity, the Jade Emperor, to send rain. Okay. Uh, they were basically like, you know, please, uh, Jade Emperor, send rain to these provinces in China. They're suffering from a drought and they're in misery. And the deity uh, agreed. But being a bureaucratic figure, um, and if you kind of think of deities of the sky that rule over the cosmos, they are sort of bureaucratic figures. They have other deities that govern for them because they're occupied with the order of the universe. So this uh, jade emperor in, in the sky was, he was like, yes, let me get to that. But like any sort of CEO or something like that, they had other things that were going on at the same time. And so the jade emperor got distracted, got absorbed, other things that were taking place in the different corners of the empire. And so um, he had agreed, but he didn't follow through. He didn't follow through with the promise. As a result, many people died. The land became cracked and dry. The drought was so severe, and the dragons were so 
distressed. They were distressed on the part of the people. And so what the dragons decided to do was to act on their own. And what they did is that they took to the air, they took to the rivers, they took to the seas and the streams, and they brought rain to this part of mainland China that was suffering. The Jade Emperor, when he found out, was furious because they had stepped out of line, they had gone out of their bureaucratic functions, they had taken the rule, law, and authority upon themselves, even though he was distracted. And this might have seen as an assistance. I mean, he did initially give his word. The dragons had stepped out of line and, and defied him. He was so angry that he ordered the mountain god to seal the dragons up inside of it um, for all time. Okay, so this emperor was not like, you know, wasn't like for a couple of months or a year or two or a decade or three. He ordered the mountain god, he was so angry at these dragons, to seal up the dragons inside the mountain for all time, for all, for, for the rest of, of existence. But from this mountain sprang four rivers, and these were the dragons. They sprang rivers from their mountain prison, and these rivers continuously work to protect China. These rivers are known today as the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Pearl River, and the Amur River. So this is such a fascinating image, you know, that they're encapsulated, but then the dragons merge with earth to create rivers that still perform benevolence, that still protect, that still bring life. And so this is why the ancient Chinese peoples didn't blame dragons for natural catastrophes and other disasters, but instead they saw dragons as benevolent, wise, and powerful. And if I dare say, maybe a little bit more benevolent and wise than the ruling emperor, but that's anyway between you and me. So, so here we have the figure of the dragon, this benevolent figure, this collage of different animals. You know, it's not just a reptilian dinosaur with wings breathing fire and sporting dragon breath. <laughs> you know, no, it's this collage. And again, there's a kind of Jupiterian flavor because Jupiter gathers and weaves together all the different aspects of all the different planets. Jupiter is in astrology, ultimately an integrator. And the dragon itself is eclectic in its nature. It's a symbol of empire because it takes in that original conquest of the other provinces, it takes their totems and unites them together in one overriding totem, which is the totem of the dragon. Now let's talk about the elements in Chinese astrology. In the West, we have four elements. That's water, earth, air, and fire. But in Chinese astrology, there are five. It's wood, it's fire, it's metal, it's earth, and it's water. Okay, I'm not saying that that's the proper order, but that's the order of things. So in Chinese astrology, there's no air element. Um, and then they have the element of metal and the element of wood which are curious and infinitely intriguing ideas. Um, in uh, Taoist symbolism, metal was symbolized as the incense burner, you know, the container that held the incense. Wood was symbolized by a tree. Fire was symbolized by flames. And water was symbolized by the lotus and um, the lotus leaf. And then earth was seldom symbolized. It was actually seen as the center of the four elements because earth is the center of the universe and earth is where we live and we live on land. But when and if earth was symbolized, it was often symbolized by pheasants or by other birds that chose not to fly, but to live close to the earth. And that was the symbol for earth and its fecundity. So let's talk about wood. Why are we talking about wood? Because uh, this year is the year of the dragon, but this year is the year of the wood dragon. Okay, so, so each of the Chinese zodiac animals can appear or align with an element, all right? And they can be in any of the elements. You can have a metal dragon, you can have a fire dragon, you can have a earth dragon, you can have a water dragon. This year is a wood dragon. So if you're thinking of, you know, one... Uh, uh, I don't know, wheel of fortune spinning, it goes click, 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 and it hits on dragon, and then an, uh, an inner wheel goes click, 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 and hits on wood. This is the time of the wood dragon. So wood, as I mentioned before, was symbolized by a tree. It's intriguing because when you look at tarot cards, which originate in Italy, 
and which was on the other side of the Silk Roads that were going back and forth between the Mideast and China. But then it also goes into uh, Venice and Italy, where where uh, culture and things are being exchanged along with tea and jewelry and metals and all these sorts of things. What's interesting about these five elements in Chinese astrology, where you have metal and wood, which we wouldn't really think of as being an element, um, and then you've got uh, water, fire, and earth, What's kind of fascinating is when you think of the tarot, okay, the tarot, you've got the major arcana, then you've got the minor arcana. The minor arcana are known as suits, and each of the suits are associated to an element, um, water, earth, fire, and air. But what's fascinating is that when you look at the symbolism in the tarot, is two things. One, you have wood show up in tarot. If you're familiar with tarot and the suit of wands or clubs, you know that that's wood. These are wooden clubs, you know, or, or they are wands. They are the idea of things growing up out of the ground. It's associated to fire, but it's definitely the object is wood in the tarot. And it's actually the only um, object of the four suits that's a living organism. Okay. And, and that's wood. And I find that curious that that connects to the Chinese elements but it kind of makes sense when you remember that Tarot comes out of Italy and Italy uh, shared the Silk Road's route uh, into Asia where ideas and, and trade and goods and spices were being brought back and forth. Remember, Marco Polo comes from Italy and goes and resides and becomes a governor in, in, in China. Um, so, so that's interesting, you know, that in the Tarot, that the element of fire, which is rods and rods is associated to wood. And so you have that sort of showing up there. But then what's also fascinating is swords, which are associated with air, is metal. Cups in the tarot is metal. <laughs> okay, it's from a metal. Um, and uh, coins in the tarot, which is pentacles, uh, which is earth. Uh, cups is water. Pentacles is earth. That's metal. And so you have this really fascinating overlay of the Chinese elements on the Western elements appearing in the tarot deck. Anyway, just had to do that as a quick aside. So wood, the element of wood in Chinese astrology was symbolized as a tree. It symbolizes growth. It can be flexible like bamboo, or it can be majestic and long-lived like a cypress tree. And cypress trees in, in China symbolize longevity and the strong heart of a virtuous people who never surrenders. Um, wood as an element, also stands for the springtime, the east where the sun rises. It's connected to Jupiter. It's connected to the color green, windy weather, and it is connected to the azure dragon, which is the dragon of the spring. Wood attributes are strength and flexibility, warmth, generosity, cooperation, and idealism. Negative expressions of a wood element is anger and hopelessness. Okay, like a feeling of I've lost all faith. I've lost all direction. <clears throat> and then the positive attributes of wood are optimism, courage, patience, and you recognize the Ju Jupiterian characteristic, benevolence. Wood rules the liver in Chinese medicine. I, I know I'm like making these correlations, but in Western astrology, you know, you know that Jupiter is also connected to the liver. So you're getting these connections to Jupiter uh, that are very strong. So wood is born from water. Okay, in the elemental cycle, it feeds fire. Okay, so wood, wood springs with water to become a tree and grow. It feeds fire. If you start a forest fire, the trees go up. Wood controls the element of earth because the roots of the trees hold earth together. Okay, so trees anchor themselves into earth. And we also know after fires, um, which devastate trees, uh, you have mudslides because there's nothing holding the earth in place anymore. Wood has control, has supremacy over earth. And then finally, wood can be destroyed by metal because if you take an ax, you can chop down a tree. So, so this is this idea, it kind of sounds a little bit like, you know, rock, scissors, paper, you know, which element, you know, goes over the other and they can all do this. But in that description that I gave you, you can see the elements that wood works with versus the elements that wood doesn't really uh, work with or isn't perhaps that compatible. All right, 
so what is a wood dragon, right? Because we're in the year of the wood dragon. Dragons were believed to preside over the seasons and the directions of the world. Okay, so you've got uh, east, uh, south, west, north. Okay, and then those are going to be connected to the seasons as well. So the green dragon was identified with the east and the spring. The white dragon ruled the west and was identified with the season of autumn. White is traditionally connected to death and mourning in Chinese culture. However, a white Chinese dragon also symbolized purity and virtue. The black dragons ruled the north and were associated with winter. Black Chinese dragons are often related to vengeance. In ancient China, the black dragon is often linked to catastrophes like storms and floods. And if you think of winter, when do you have storms and floods? Okay, in, in, in a country like China, you have them in, in the winter, and so that's associated to a black dragon. And the South in China, the South actually got two dragons. Okay, I don't know how they lucked out the, with that, but the South got two dragons. They got the red dragon and the yellow dragon. Red dragons are associated to luck and prosperity. Yellow dragons were a symbol of the imperial dynasty. It was regarded as a royal color. It was the symbol of the emperor, the yellow dragon, and it represented wisdom, good fortune, and power. So by being in the year of the wood dragon, we're basically in the year of the blue-green dragon. In Chinese culture, blue and green are the colors representing nature, health, healing, peace, and growth. A blue-green dragon symbolizes the approach of spring, new life, and plant growth. What we could almost regard this year as being a year of spring, of things beginning, of newness, of springing forth, of there being the enthusiasm of moving forward into our life. The east is the direction that the green dragon rules over, and the east is ruled by the wood sire, Mongong. The ancient name was Dong Wangong who was Lord King of the East. Wood governs the dragon, so people born in the year of the dragon will do exceptionally well this year. People born in the year of the monkey and the rat will also do well. And people born in the years of the dog, ox, and sheep may find them struggling a bit, themselves struggling a bit. So I want to close this with a wonderful medieval um, story that is told. The title of it is The Dragon and the Pearl. During the Han Dynasty in the, the city of Laoyang, there was a cave. And this cave was very dark and its depth was unfathomable. No one had ever been to the bottom of this cave. Um, and a woman who harbored murderous intention towards her husband suggested one day, why don't we go see this cave? I've never seen this dark cave. And the husband was like, well, that's a dangerous place. That cave is bottomless if you fall. Why are you so curious? And she's like, I'm just curious, husband. So let's go see the cave. Hmm? And the husband was like, okay, let's. And so they go, you know, maybe it's an afternoon stroll or something like this. Anyway, they go to this cave. Um, and of course, as soon as they arrive, they enter the cave and it's very dark. You can't see anything. And she, you know, says, Husband, you go in front of me. You're, you're braver. You have more courage. He's peering around the dark and, you know, she pushes him over and he falls into, into the bottomless pit of this cave. You know, he falls down um, a great height. You hear him go, he, does, he goes on down. She doesn't hear him anymore. He's disappeared into the void and she's brought some, um, she's brought some uh, sacrifice with her and she throws it um, after him into the void, so asking the blessing of the departed spirit. So not only has she, you know, pushed the, her husband to his death, but she's offered a sacrifice to his ghost all at the same time. She turns around and she leaves the cave. And uh, she also happens to uh, leave the story. Um, what was in the sacrifice? The sacrifice was food that she had thrown down to feed the hungry ghost that would emerge from her husband's body. Well, her husband didn't die. He fell down this cave and he kind of, and he lost consciousness and he fell a great distance. Uh, but for some reason, he regained consciousness at the bottom of the cave and it was very, very dark and his bones weren't broken. He was fine, but he was desperately hungry um, at the bottom of this cave and it was dark and he didn't know how to get out. And he called and of course his voice echoed and nobody answered and, and, and there he was. So he began to look for a path out of this deep, dark, 
forbidding cave. And he followed this, this path, um, you know, after eating the food that his wife had thrown him. And, and that felt good that, you know, he was hungry. And so he ate some food that his wife had thrown his hungry ghost, but he didn't die. It's him. So he's eating the food. And he follows this path and he walks for a very long time. He walks for several miles, uncannibal miles. Um, and, and this path was rugged. It zigzagged. It went up and down. It veered to the left and the right. After walking several miles, he noticed that the light in the cave became brighter. And it was more than just his eyes adjusting to it. He could actually see uh, his, his hand. He could see the sides of the cave um, and the ground. The ground beneath his feet felt like dust. You know, they didn't feel like rocks. They had changed. It wasn't those sharp rocks, those rugged terrain. It was now like dust in a way. And he began to smell, wafting through these dark caverns that were gradually becoming brighter, he began to smell the fragrance of rice. So he followed the fragrance of rice and, and, and he followed it to its source, which was rice. Um, which he delighted in, and he ate his fill, and he kind of, you know, stuffed or put, to, you know, maybe used part of his tunic or whatever, maybe the sack that his wife had thrown, you know, to 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 store more rice, you know, as he, you know, kind of like, you know, eating popcorn in a movie, eating the rice, uh, continued through the dark passages of this cave again for miles and miles and miles. Um, finally. When he had eaten all that he had eaten of the rice and he was wondering about what was going to come next, he came upon a huge, enormous, splendid city. Now this city, well, the walls of the city were tall and the palaces of the city, the palaces of the city were magnificent and the terraces and the pavilions and the residences of the city were all decorated with gold. Though there was no sun or moon or stars in the sky that he could see, the city was greater than those sources of light, including the sun, the moon, and the stars. It was more golden. It was more luminescent. And there were people in the city who came out to greet him that he uh, sh uh, shrunk away from because they were 30 feet tall. They were enormous people. And he was like maybe five, six feet or whatever. And they're 30 feet tall. Um, and they wore resplendent silk garments and played unique music, which was never heard in this world. Then the man pleaded for food. And as the uh, medieval author writes here, sadly. <laughs> okay, so he, he didn't just like, you know, hey, do you have something to eat? You know, he pleaded for food, sadly, with longing, with melancholy. He was so hungry. Um, and a tall man came forward and asked him to, to walk in this direction. And the man said, yes, he, he obeyed. And following the order of the tall 30-foot man, the husband walked past nine palaces that were exactly the same, nine palaces that were gorgeous, nine palaces that were aromatic, nine palaces that were more splendid than, than this world could possibly offer. In, in their colors and in their architecture and in their serenity and in their beauty. So he walked past these, last, these nine palaces. And when he reached the last palace, he was even more hungry than when he had begun the journey. His, his, his stomach, he, he just was so starving with hunger. And the tall man pointed to a huge cypress tree. And under the tree was a goat. All right. And the tall man directed the husband to the goat, and he uh, told the husband to stroke the goat's beard. And when the husband stroked the goat's beard, out of the beard and into the palm of his hand fell a pearl. And the husband was like, what's this? And the tall 30-foot man immediately grabbed that pearl and took it out of the husband's hand. And the husband looked inquiring, inquisitively, curiously, why did you do this? And the tall 30-foot man said, stroke the goat's beard again. And so he did, and he stroked the goat's beard again. And again, out of the goat's beard dropped a pearl. And he was like, this is brilliant. And the tall man immediately seized that pearl too and took it away from him. And he said, stroke one more time. And the husband did. And out of the uh, goat's beard fell a pearl. And this time, 
This time when the pearl fell into his hand, the tall 30-foot man said, eat it. And the man was like, eat it? Eat what? He said, eat the pearl. He's like, eat the pearl? <laughs> what eats pearls? And he's like, eat the pearl. You can eat this one. And so the man took the pearl and he bit into it and he could eat it. It, it wasn't hard like a pearl. He could eat the pearl and he swallowed the pearl and immediately his hunger abated. It disappeared. His stomach was full. This pearl, this pearl had completely satisfied his appetite. At that point, the husband asked the tall man, what are the names of the palaces? You know, and the tall man said, I cannot tell you. And the husband said, can I stay here? Can I stay here in this beautiful resplendent realm with you? And the tall man said, no, no, you cannot. And he's like, well, what's, what's to become of me? And the tall man said, you need to go back home. You cannot stay here. You need to go back home. But you can take these with you. And he presented the husband with the two other pearls. And he said, our ruler has already said that you cannot stay. But when you return home, you are to ask the wise man Zhang Hong, who is familiar with this place, where you have been. And so the husband agreed. And he returned home. Now, it took the husband a long time to return home. I think it took him like six to seven years to return home, to find his way out of this and to find his way back to his home. But he did. And seven years later, when he returned home, he visited Zhang Hua, and he showed him the two pearls that had been given to him. And he told him his story and asked him to explain where he had been. Uh, Zhang Hua said, the substance like dust that we walked on was the saliva of the Yellow River Dragon. It's like, oh. Remember the dragons that were like uh, bound in that mountain? It was the, the dust was the saliva of the Yellow River Dragon. And the mud, the mud was from the cool mountain. The immortal who guarded the nine palaces, who came out to greet you, the 30 foot tall man, he is called the Grand Master of the Nine Palaces. And the goat, the goat was a dim witted dragon, I'm afraid. And he's like, a dim witted dragon? And he said, yes. He gave you three pearls. And he said, yes. And he said, the first pearl you got, and he said, yes, this, this first pearl, enables one to live as long as heaven and earth if the person can eat it. Oh, but, but, it, but I can't eat it. And this second pearl that you have? He said, yes. The second pearl is able to prolong one's lifespan. It is, yes if you can eat it. But I can't eat this pearl. And he said, and the third pearl that you were given? He said, yes. The third pearl may be eaten just as food. But that's what I did. I ate it just as food. And the wise man said, and what did you feel afterwards? And he said, my stomach was full. And he said, exactly. What I love about this story, that's the end of the story, um, <clears throat> which when I reached the end of it, I laughed <laughs> because it's very funny, but it's also very telling. And it's also very revealing about this year where Pluto is entering the zodiac sign of Aquarius. These are literally pearls of wisdom, okay, which have been given to this husband who is not a very wise or smart person. He doesn't suspect his wife for a moment when his wife says, let's go visit this cave. He walks ahead of her, looks over the edge, and she pushes him to what was supposed to be his death. Um, he wakes up at the bottom of this pit, which is going to lead into this land of immortality. He's frightened and he's hungry, and he eats. The first thing he eats is, is, is mortal food, which, as we all know from Persephone and Demeter, bound, binds him to the mortal world. And then he travels through the cavern and he smells the rice, and he finds the rice and he eats the rice. But what's happening here is that he's eating, he's consuming. All he cares about is how hungry he is as he goes through this. Now, at first we can be like, well, come on, Christopher. He, he, he survived a bottomless pit drop. What do you want from this guy? <laughs> you know, and, yeah, it's true. And, 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 and he, no broken bones and, and he's hungry. And he, but, but he's hungering for 
things of this world. He's hungering for the things of this world that we live in. He's hungering for something that will sate his appetite. He wants to be full. Okay. And then he comes to this beautiful city and he's shown this goat, this dim-witted goat who produces three pearls. Okay. So even though, though the goat is dim-witted, it can produce wisdom. And in my interpretation of it, I see the dim-witted goat as actually being his double. The dim-witted goat is as dim-witted as he is. <laughs> and the immortal takes the pearls, you know, that he produces out and he holds them apart. And he says, the third one's the one you're looking for. The third one will satiate your appetite. And he eats it. He can eat a pearl. And he's like, mm, I feel so good afterwards. And then the immortal, which is what immortals do, gives him the two other pearls, one that can bring life as long as heaven and earth, okay, which is obviously a reference to transcendence and the spiritual realm, and the other which can bring long life, but he can't eat them. That's not what his intention was. That's not where his focus was. And the immortal already knows this because the immortal says, you know what, when you get back to your land and when your city, ask this wise man where you have been, he'll be able to explain it all to you. He'll be able to basically tell you the moral of the tale. And he does. And the man is left with two pearls that he cannot eat they are the gifts, which are the most tremendous gifts that one should ever hope or long for, but he cannot take them in. And it's a beautiful parable. It's a beautiful story about wisdom, you know, um, and about our bellies and about our spirit. You know, when we are wise according to our bellies, we're very good at getting the next thing, you know, to satiate our ravenous appetite. You know, we are confronted with a mystery. We're confronted with an enigma and we want the answer. We want the solution to it. Um, and once we get the answer or the solution to it or the moral to the tale or the explanation of why things happened the way they did, we go, we're satisfied. And we go on to the next bright, shiny object. We go on to the next riddle. We go on to the next question. You know, and that's a wisdom that can be perhaps smart. Um, it's a curiosity that can be satisfied. It's an attention span that can be wandering or a sense of discovery that doesn't go beyond the satiated belly. One can become very inventive. One can be very resourceful. One can invent marvelous things like our civilization has. Doesn't make us wise. And this is how it plays into Pluto entering into the zodiac sign of Aquarius. We can create things that are technologically superior to life before. We can uh, create things that harness, uh, that supposedly harness nature, you know, that harness the dragons, um, and, but yet fall short, you know, as, as I mean, I'm not going to tell you, you already know about climate change and global warming and all these sorts of things. We inherited this, this majestic world. And what are we doing with it in our um, pursuit of technology and gain? And we're following that third pearl that, could from, that can be easily um, eaten and that fulfills the appetite but leaves us hungry or yearning for more. The other two pearls prolonged life, living as long as earth and heaven, basically becoming an immortal. We cannot imbibe. We cannot eat. We cannot digest, you know, uh, because we are so bound to the pearl that wants immediate gratification, that wants immediate satisfaction. So like the husband in the story, we carry these pearls of wisdom. We can show them to people. We can ask people what they think. People can admire them. People can interpret them. People can say, this is what it means. We can own them, but we can't imbibe them. We can't digest them. We can't take them into our being. They always remain outside as gifts, as gifts that also cannot be opened. And the beauty of this story, which combines with Pluto entering Aquarius in this year, is what do you do 
with something that you have, but you cannot take in. Instead of that becoming something that's frustrating, it's bewildering, or something that we even get angry at, these pearls, these two other pearls of wisdom can be, can be things that guide us through our life, our pursuit of the wisdom, our pursuit of understanding by asking questions or marveling at miracle or being open to the experience of mysticism, uh, being open to whatever connections we have with the invisible realms that lie beyond this world, this place where dragons can go to and come back from. This is the sort of wisdom that I pray and hope that we can acquire eventually, and that we may, in our dark, scrambling walks through the rugged, uh, zigzagging passages of the dark, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll come to a place of illumination and light.